The alternate John 3.16. What do I mean by alternate? What I mean is this, is that we've had a certain understanding of what this particular scripture means. And that particular meaning usually comes from the way we've been taught. Once we become believers, others have instilled things into our minds. And as we've read particular pieces of scripture, we've understood those things in context with all the other scriptures that we've read. Sometimes it's not so easy to accept something that's deeper. But as I was sitting at my desk, the Lord spoke to me and said, Have you considered something deeper with John 3.16? And there was something that I had not really, really considered. And I shared it with my family, and they asked me to make this particular recording so that they could access it from the different points that they're at. And if you are watching this, and you're not part of my family, then you're certainly welcome to um, be blessed by this, by this message, and listen to it. But I ask that you listen to it with an open heart. In John 3.16, it comes to a very interesting point in the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Earlier in chapter 3, he talks to Nicodemus about being born again, or being born from above. And Nicodemus is confused. And Jesus continues on to the gets to this point where he talks to Nicodemus and says, For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So we've heard this particular scripture so many, many times that in our minds sometimes we begin to substitute words for other words or meanings. The most common understanding of what this really says are people start to understand that for God so loved the world that he gave or what they substitute in their minds is sacrificed his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish or go to the lake of fire but have everlasting life that is go to heaven so if we take that and again restate that, how we sometimes really hear it in our minds, what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is, For God so loved the whole world that he sacrificed his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not go to the lake of fire, but go to heaven. And that's generally how most of us have viewed this particular scripture. I mean, God challenged me. And he said, think about when you got married. Think about what the minister said when your bride came down the aisle. And he looked right at your father-in-law. Now there was this question that went out. And that question was, who gives this bride up for marriage? And he wanted me to understand that particular word of give. In the Greek scripture, it's didomai, which is to bestow, to give, a present. But he wanted me to understand, in that aspect that he was reminding me of, as he was building this whole concept up, was from the bride's perspective. But he reminded me, in that age, in that day, in that time, marriages were prearranged. We just had to look at the book of Judges to understand and see that Samson desired a Philistine woman, so he went to his parents and said, Arrange this marriage for me. And of course, Samson's father said, Why are you looking at a Philistine woman? Aren't there any in our own, within our own people that you would desire to marry? He goes, No, I want that woman. Arrange the marriage. So Samson's father was, a, was ob obliged to arrange the marriage. In so manner, that's what God was showing me here. You see, what he said is, if we took the understanding that we already had for so long about the sacrifice, 
What that would really be saying is that Jesus would be sitting across from Nicodemus and starts to say, Nicodemus, God loves you a heck of a lot more than he loves me. He loves you enough to sacrifice me so that you can go to heaven. That's what the enemy wants us to hear. Because that doesn't really require, require us to do anything. Except have a belief. That doesn't even sound right when you think about it. Nicodemus, God love, my father loves you more than he loves me, his own son. That he's willing to sacrifice me, kill me off so that you could go to heaven. That just doesn't even sound right. And that particular stance is a detraction from everything that he's saying in John 3, 3, throughout John 4. So what happens is we understand this arrangement of the marriage. You see, the father has to consent to this. And he does consent. He loves the world so much that he allowed this marriage to take place between his son and the church or those who believe in him. That they should not perish but have everlasting life because they will be grafted into him. The whole idea of the marriage it is so central to the Gospel of John and John's thought that even at the end of the book of Revelation, that's the most glorious event when the church and Christ are wed and become one. Is it any wonder then that the first miracle that John records that Jesus did is at the wedding of Cana, which all the elements are very indicative of the very wedding that will take place at the end of Revelation. So no wonder when he says, God so loved the whole world. What he's saying is, Nicodemus, God loves you and, and the rest of the, the body enough that he's allowing this marriage between you and me so that we will be one together. You will be grafted into those who believe should not perish because they'll be one with me. And I, if I could be so bold as to interject something that's really not in Scripture, but really a part of the intent, I can just imagine Jesus saying to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus, I love my bride so much that I pay the dowry with my life so that this marriage would be complete. That is in keeping with the word didyma. Because didyma is that whole aspect of gift. Bestowing. And that's exactly what he's done. He's allowed his son to marry this church and be one. And the love that will exist between both will be as such that it will bring such glory to God. deeper meaning of what is found here in John 3.16. Are we prepared to be the bride of Christ? That's really what it's all about. We just can't live our lives thinking, well, I believe like George, I believe George Washington was the first president of the United States. That's not the belief he's talking about. We just need to look at the last chapter of Mark to understand what belief is. And that belief comes from a deep-rooted love, a love that we have for Jesus, a love that we have for his Father. For no man can come to the Father unless they come through him. And if we love him and set our sight and our mind upon him, then we will.